welcome everybody to lecture number eight, the last in our New Testament series as we look at the book of Revelation tonight. And uh, thank you for sticking it out and being here. And I trust that this book will become alive to you. But I trust more than that, that the whole of the New Testament will really take on new significance to you as you go back and reread the books of the New Testament uh, that we have studied together. Uh, tonight will be a slightly shorter lecture to give an, an opportunity for those who write the exam to do so at the end of our lecture time together. The book of Revelation starts this way. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Now, of course, John was talking about the coming of Jesus, and that's the context of the book of Revelation. Um, Revelation helps us to see salvation history. That's, that's essentially what this book is about. And it's been written to people, as we'll see later on, uh, who have been suffering persecution. And obviously the question that they ask is, where is God? Where does God fit in all of this? Now, remember, this is towards the end of the first century. We're talking about 70 years, maybe, um, less than 70 years since Jesus ascended to heaven. And, and people were expecting the coming of Jesus. He's, he's arrived. He died on the cross. He has given his life. We, ha we have been saved. But physically, practically, day to day, we don't see much of that happening. We have peace in our hearts. We know God has saved us. But why are we suffering? Why are we uh, being persecuted by the authorities? And, and that's essentially behind the book of Revelation, which is not uncommon for material that we call apocalyptic material. If you go back to the book of Daniel, uh, parts of Ezekiel, and you will find a similar kind of line uh, that is used. And then there are extra biblical books, especially in the New Testament, that follow exactly the same approach. And that is, we're being persecuted. Where is God in all of this? And, and apocalyptic material, uh, the style, wants to help people to see life, the world, from God's perspective. And that's where the visions come in. So you have a person who has received all these visions from God and is now sharing it with his readers to say, this is where God fits in. Let me help you understand the picture. We live in a tiny little hole on a massive big wall. God sees the whole wall, but... I can only see what I see. I can't even see the wall. I can only see the little hole where I'm living in. And uh, if we had a big wall behind me, I, I would actually use that illustration. But, but just see that as a massive big picture that God is busy painting. And I'm only one tiny, tiny, tiny little stroke on this huge picture that is called history. And when John writes to his uh, readers, the recipients of this letter or this book, the first ones, then he's trying to help them understand that God is ultimately in control. Now, he goes on, the rest of chapter 1 is introductory, tells us about John's vision, then there's the seven letters to uh, the churches in Asia Minor, and then when you come to chapter 4, which I want to read just to help us understand that particular picture, which I also want to leave with you tonight by way of, of devotional thoughts. It says, after this, and this is now after he's written all those seven letters, after this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Now, that's a, that's a key concept. John is seeing something that the normal eye cannot see. It's visionary material. He sees a door open in heaven, and it's an open door. Now, that's comforting because some of uh, of our belief is that, that God is unapproachable. That was part of the belief in the Old Testament as well. Therefore, you always need a, pre a priest or you need someone else as a mediator. But since Jesus came to this world, we don't need another mediator but Jesus Christ himself. And so the door in heaven is open. 
And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, again, it's interpreting history. History as it happened, as it is happening in the present, and then also as it will happen in the future. So we shouldn't just look at Revelation as a study of the future, what eventually will happen. That seems to be the angle, but there's a lot more in Revelation. It's, it's about perspective. It gives you, if you know the future, you have present perspective. And coming from the history, which we can study. So it's history in the past. There's the present where we live. But there's also the future that beckons us. And, and that's the angle that we have in the book of Revelation. And then a key concept that I want to share with you tonight and leave it with you. The voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Verse 2, At once I was in the Spirit. In other words, it's a visionary type material. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Now you may just normally read over this particular line. But I want to tell you that this is key to understanding the book of Revelation. In fact, it's key to understanding Christianity. It's key to understanding who I am. There's a throne in heaven, and someone is sitting on it. What is John saying? There's a God. And as you read the context further, you will see God is the one on the throne. And God is on the throne. He is in control. And God is busy establishing His kingdom. Now, in my little hole on the wall, I can't always see that. In fact, I can't really see much where I live. I may only see the experiences I have right now, which may be bad at the moment, or may be good, but I certainly don't see the big picture. But John is saying there's a God in heaven who sits on a throne, and He rules, He reigns, and He will reign forever. And that's the whole theme throughout the book of Revelation. And unless you understand some of those big strokes in the book of Revelation, the detail uh, will definitely confuse us. I mean, there, there's no doubt that the detail is very, very difficult to understand. John goes on to describe his experience where he saw God. Uh, there's a rainbow. Then there surrounding the throne uh, were 24 other thrones seated upon them, 24 elders. And uh, symbolically, it's probably a reference to the 12 tribes in the Old Testament plus the 12 apostles in the New Testament making up the people of God. And again, the people of God, God's nation, God's people, um, are represented before and around the throne. God is in the middle and around Him we have the people representing Old and New Testament. And then flashes of lightning um, rumblings and, and uh, peals of thunder before the throne. Seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. It's, it's probably, again, a symbolic reference for the Spirit of God. Seven spirits, or um, in, in this particular case, uh, seven lamps that are blazing. And in front of the throne, there, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, there were four living creatures, and they were covered... Uh, with eyes in front and behind and so forth. And they had wings and they were serving God. Probably representing all of creation, those living creatures. Um, those heavenly beings and earthly beings and, and, and oceanic beings and all of those represented in the presence uh, of God. And then they were crying. And here John is reaching back into the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 6. And they were day and night. They never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Quoting uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and lives forever, the 24 elders representing us, representing the people of God, they, they fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne. In other words, they worship. They acknowledge that God is the one in control. And uh, this, is, this is the call here for all of us, is to lay down our crowns, as it were, to say, Lord, we worship you, we honor you. You are the king, and you rule, and you reign. And then they say, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created 
and have their being. My, my whole being, my very existence depends on God. And therefore, I need to put my trust and my faith in Him. Regardless of what is happening in my little hole on the wall, uh, I may be disappearing in my little hole on the wall at the moment, but my faith and my trust is in God. Same theme that we find in Hebrews chapter 11. People who lived in, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, ranging from um, uh, he, uh, Abraham and David and, and all of the, um, the judges and, and the prophets and the kings, they put their faith in God, although they didn't always see what was going to happen. Whether it was Noah who simply trusted God and therefore built an ark, or Abraham trusting and putting his faith in God, not knowing where he was going to end up, or not knowing whether there's going to be a son for him, and he was almost 100 years old already. But he continued to believe in God. And that's the message of uh, the book of Revelation. Continue to believe in God, even when the going gets tough here on earth. But let's pray together and then we'll get into the book of Revelation and study its background. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray that you would help us as we look into your word tonight to uh, gain deeper understanding of the way that you work in this world, but also the way that you are planning the future and that you are ultimately in control. And like the elders, Lord, tonight we come to put our crowns before you and to worship you and to bow before you as the King of the universe. We pray that you would guide our thoughts uh, and that you would also bless us as we uh, come to the end of our study of the New Testament. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of the New Testament can really be summarized, I believe, in uh, different ways. Uh, up to this point in time, I've, every time I've taken you through the New Testament by talking about the Gospels, the book of Acts, and then the epistles, and we've looked at Paul's epistles, general epistles, and so on. But there, there's another way that we can look at it. Um, there are three different ways. And actually, in a certain sense, it represents the past. That's the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, where Jesus came into this world, and um, he died, he gave his life, and established the church. And then uh, that story is told in the Gospels, the four of them. The story of the church is told in the book of Acts. And, and in the epistles, where we have apostles and others writing to the churches. And um, in those writings, we discover more and more about what church and church is really about. And how we should be living in this world as the church. And then, as we come to the end of the New Testament... We, we're really looking at the culmination of the plan of God. It's all along, it has been the plan of God. I think I may have said this to you before, and we'll, I will confirm this when, if you stay with me in, in the fourth module, when we look at what I call the big picture. Um, and that is that God is ultimately in control. He has been in control. He has created the world and the universe with a purpose. And God will fulfill that purpose at the end. And, and nothing will stand in His way. And that is essentially the message of the book of Revelation. So as we come to a conclusion in the book of Revelation, we're looking at the culmination of God's plan. And part of that plan is described as, as history. It's described in visionary type material. Uh, but ultimately the second coming, uh, which will bring it all to culmination, is what we are anticipating. And so that's just another way of looking at the story of the Bible, as it were. Uh, God preparing the world for the New Testament, so that Jesus at his second coming will bring it all to a conclusion. Tonight we will be looking at uh, the book of Revelation. I, I believe, as I said to you before, that it's not just about the second coming, although that is a, a major theme uh, in this book. And it's also not the only book where we read about the second coming. We've already looked at uh, First and Second Thessalonians, two books uh, that are focused on the second coming, and there are several others in the New Testament, uh, including the Gospels, where we read about that. But Revelation does provide us with an overall picture of God's salvation plan. It's a, it's a key concept to hold on to, salvation plan. God had a salvation plan. Even before the creation of the universe and the world, God had a plan, and that plan will, be, uh, re will reach its fulfillment uh, in the future. I like this uh, particular picture that I found. I don't own this book, but there's a book called The Book of Revelation for Dummies, uh, just as it is a book, for, uh, a book on Windows or some computer program for dummies. 
Um, and, and I think most of us probably feel this way, that we really need a book of Revelation for dummies. Because when I, when I open the book of Revelation, I feel like a, a person not really understanding what's going on uh, in this book. But as we uh, look at the book tonight, it has been described by many as a difficult book, and, and rightly so, for good reason, I believe. Um, and oftentimes people avoid it. Uh, perhaps the first couple of chapters uh, we get into, especially the seven letters, they exciting material, and they make for wonderful background study. Uh, many people have taken a tour of the seven churches uh, in modern-day Turkey uh, and visiting those particular sites, uh, Ephesus and Philadelphia, Sardis and Smyrna and those. Um, and it makes for wonderful study when you read through Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Uh, when you get to chapters 4 and 5, uh, I have read chapter 4 and, and just dealt with that briefly tonight. Still, very exciting stuff. When you get to the rest of the book that you really uh, almost sometimes hit a brick wall and you wonder mm, what's going on here and well, what, what are all these symbols and visions and, and what do they mean and where do they uh, fit in. So tonight uh, we're going to give, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the book of Revelation, trying to break it down. I'm not going to tell you everything in terms of interpreting the book of Revelation. There is just way too much, number one. And secondly, there, there, there are too many different views and opposing views as to how you need to understand the book of Revelation. So it's not my purpose here to come with a final answer, but to, to help you, to give you some guidelines as to how you can read the book of Revelation uh, in the future. Um, in terms of required reading, um, there is just a... Uh, uh, an overwhelming uh, amount of different books and resources on the book of Revelation, and as many views. Uh, if you have a thousand books, you'll probably have a thousand different views on exactly how you need to interpret the book of Revelation. And so I, I would encourage you to maybe read our prescribed material, and then to read the book of Revelation. I think that's the, the most important thing. And um, in terms of background material, there's, there's plenty uh, that you can do. That word, salvation history, that I highlighted earlier on, in my mind, summarizes the book of Revelation. If you don't understand that concept, you will drown in the detail. Um, and that's one thing that I, I'm going to highlight. Um, <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, when you look at this picture, for example, um, you will see all sorts of different ways in which people have even graphically uh, painted the picture of the book of Revelation. When you read through it, you go back to Ezekiel and some pictures in Daniel and Zechariah and others. Uh, it creates very strange pictures, some, some kind of Hollywood science fiction type movies. And some of that really looks like science fiction uh, when, you, when you read through it. And it makes for wonderful um, titles for movies, uh, The Battle of Arm Armageddon and, and all those titles that we have seen uh, in the past. But we have heard different and sometimes very weird interpretations of the book of Revelation. And I want to just caution you to try and hold on to the whole picture rather than get lost uh, in the detail of Revelation. And as I said, many of us, uh, including myself, oftentimes stop it at uh, uh, chapter 5 because that's the exciting stuff. Uh, and then we sometimes may go over to the last few chapters because that's specifically where the second coming is addressed. But it's the middle big section of the book of Revelation that really makes for very difficult reading and interpretation. One thing that I want to highlight is the main thing. And you have to keep the main thing the main thing. Because if you lose sight of the main thing, you will drown in the detail of the different visions. And if you start attaching meaning and significance and interpretation to every single little detail in the book of Revelation, then you're going to be totally overwhelmed. There, there are too many symbols, too many uh, finer details, uh, that if you are going to try and study them and give significance or meaning or interpretation to every one of them, then you will certainly drown in the book. But the one thing that we do not find in Revelation uh, is, this, is the date of the second coming. You can study it from back to front. We've had plenty of examples. If you go on the internet, even on Wikipedia, uh, and just type in... Uh, prophecies about the second coming or dates or predictions for the second coming, you'll come up with a long list in history and in future of what people have predicted about the second coming. That is not nowhere in the Bible and is definitely not in the book of Revelation. 
uh, not even if you do all of your sums and you uh, calculate them and you put them all together and you interpret and cross-reference and everything else, there is no way that anybody can uh, uh, predict the second coming of Jesus in terms of date and time. We may think that the time is near and the Bible says the time is near. It will always be near. And for God, 2,000 years since Jesus came is nothing. Uh, a thousand years is like a day, a day like a thousand years. God is above time. He's not restricted by time. So uh, God can see the future, and God knows, and only God knows when the second coming is going to take place. Even Jesus, when he was on earth with a human form in a human body, he said that even the Son of Man does not know the time. So I think it's a, it's a futile exercise to go through the book of Revelation to try and predict uh, the time of the second coming. One of the books I'm using uh, in, the, in my study of the New Testament is, is written by Elwell and Yarborough. Um, the reference is in the back of your notes. And they, they say about the 60 plus visions that we have in the book of Revelation. They need to be read for what they are, visionary accounts of reality that were given by God to portray profound spiritual and theological truths. Now, I cannot overemphasize this particular quote. Visions are visions. They are not reality. They portray or reflect reality. It's almost like a shadow. When I stand in the sun and there's a shadow on the ground, the shadow is a shadow. It's not me. It only reflects me, but it doesn't re it's not me. The real person is standing live before you. The shadow is on, on the ground. And in a certain sense, the visions portray a reality. We don't see the reality. It portrays a reality, but it's not reality. And that's what we need to hold on to and uh, believe about the book of Revelation. I have already said a few things about apocalyptic material in our study of the Old Testament. And um, now in the New Testament, the book of Revelation is a typical biblical apocalyptic book. And uh, we need to read the book in the light of what we know about apocalyptic material. It was a well-known literary genre, like poetic style or uh, narrative style. All of those are uh, literary tools that we use to communicate truth. And similarly, in the New Testament era, and the first, uh, before Christ, a couple of hundred years before Christ, and uh, a few hundred years after Christ came, we have this as a major form of communication but it used a particular literary form to communicate truth. Reality is portrayed in symbolic language, one of the things we need to hold on to. It provides an interpretation of some real events. In other words, certain things are happening. Nero is on the throne uh, of the Roman Empire, and he is persecuting people, or it may be Domitian is on the throne, and he's persecuting the Christians. That's reality around us. How do we interpret that in the light of what we know about God and about Jesus Christ? And that's what apocalyptic material is trying to do. The main emphasis, as I said, uh, that we saw in chapter 4, is that God is in control. We may not see it now, but as you look over the whole picture, as you take a step back and you look at the whole picture, and that's what Revelation is trying to do, to, to give us the big picture. They help us understand reality from God's perspective. I can only see my own life and the little hole in the wall, to use my illustration. Uh, but, but Revelation takes me a step back. It gives me a visionary view of God and God's control in this world. And therefore, it provides a God perspective. And that is what all apocalyptic material, uh, Christian or religious apocalyptic material, try to do. So what is the main message of the book of Revelation? Well, people who were suffering persecution, um, as I said before, um, need some hope. They need perspective. Right now, humanly speaking, there is zero hope. We are being persecuted. We are being killed for our faith. Where does it all lead? Is there any hope? And Revelation says, yes, there is. Because you need to look at life beyond this life. You need to look at life from God's perspective. And therefore... Um, these people who are being persecuted are given some insight into God's overall plan. And then more often than not, in coded language. It's not using direct language. It doesn't say um, the emperor in Rome uh, is an evil man. It doesn't use that language. It says 
um, there's a person who's going to come, and he has a code, and his code is 666. And if you have insight, you'll be able to find out who that is. It's coded language. Babylon is in control. Babylon's long gone. Uh, Babylon refers to the Babylonian Empire, but Babylon in the book of Revelation refers to Rome. That's coded language. So instead of talking about Rome, it talks about Babylon. And so the list goes on and on in terms of coded language. But God is in control. The devil has been and he will be overthrown. That theme comes through very clearly in Revelation. The redeemed, that is the Christians, are saved and they will be saved by Christ. It's a already and a not yet sort of feeling. I, I am saved. I don't feel it. I don't see it. I'm, I'm being killed for my faith. Uh, my family and friends and the society persecute me, yet I know that I'm saved and I will be saved in the future. And the persecutors, they are the evil ones. Uh, they will be punished and they will be judged by God. Now, that's a theological truth that is important. I heard Frank Retief speak about the incident uh, of the terrorist attack many years ago in Cape Town when uh, people came in and threw a couple of grenades, hand grenades, and shot, and so many people died uh, in St. James Church in Cape Town. And he spoke about that particular incident, and he said the one truth that kept them going as a church at the time, and even for him as an individual, is that God will ultimately judge. It's not for them to retaliate. It's not for us to retaliate. It is for us to hand it over to God and to know that God ultimately will judge. Uh, what, is, what is happening. And so, uh, in, in that sense, people who are being persecuted know that God is ultimately the judge. Now, just a few other little background issues before a little bit later we get into the contents of Revelation. The, the author of the book is indicated as John, very clearly, on the first pages of the book of Revelation, in chapter 1, verse 9, uh, as well as in chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Uh, he made it known to his servant John, and then also in chapter uh, 1, verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom. Um, the early church had very, very little problems um, in attributing the book to John. He mentions himself, and the John here would be the John who wrote the Gospel of John and the disciple of Jesus. Of course, there have always and there always will be some uh, criticism or critique against this. Um, some scholars point to the fact that the Greek is different from what you find, find in the Gospel of John, and that the teachings or the theology here represents a later era, in other words, a further development in the thinking of the Christian church. However, um, I, I think we can trust the early church um, uh, sort of verdict uh, to say that John is the author uh, of this book and uh, there's no compelling reason why we shouldn't take John uh, as the author of this book and that provides us with a little bit of the background uh, of the date and the writing of Revelation. Um, there is a major persecution behind this book so that's the first uh, clue that we need to look for, which is the major persecution. Now, in the first century, we know of at least two. One is under Nero in the 60s, and uh, it was Nero who killed uh, and murdered uh, or, or had Paul executed. And so that's one time when there was major uh, persecution. The other time uh, was in the hundreds, uh, somewhere um, between 81 when uh, Domitian, Emperor Domitian, was in control. And he also persecuted the Christians, and he, um, he was uh, replaced in the year 96. So many scholars believe that we can date the book of Revelation to the middle 90s. Um, and according to tradition, this is the time when John, ultimately, after maybe before or after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, he left uh, Judea, and he traveled north, and he went all the way to Asia Minor, and he pastored the church in Ephesus. There's a very strong early church tradition that places him in the city of Ephesus at the time. And it was here, from here, that he was then uh, sent to the island of Patmos, which became like a, um, like a prison island uh, at that particular time. When you look at this map, uh, you will find uh, on that um, 
a cross line, you will find the island of, of Patmos right there. John told us that he was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, creating the impression it is because he preached the word of God and because he shared the testimony of Jesus with others that he was being persecuted, arrested, and then sent off to the island uh, of Patmos. He also introduced himself as a brother, a companion in the suffering. In other words, all of us are suffering and I'm suffering with you. So that's the persecution referred to over here. And then, as I said, an early church tradition stated that John was banned from Ephesus and he was exiled to the island of Patmos. Um, the language in chapter 1 verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So that seems to be the background for um, the writing of the book of Revelation. Island of Patmos, and you'll see a, a map of the island on the screen with a monastery that is built there on, on the left-hand side, on the western side of the island. island. Uh, and that is traditionally where John uh, was placed in terms of um, living in, in imprisonment on this island. And some information, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but uh, this is a direct quote if you go to greektourism.gr. Uh, uh, which is helping people to find a place to go to on the Greek islands. Um, the, the language and the spelling is not always that good, uh, but it says the Second Roman Empire conquered the island, having a, as a result its decline, decline and its use by the Romans as a place of uh, exile for convicts. The message of love of the Christian gospel was conveyed to the island by one of Jesus' disciples, the Apostle John, whom the Roman Emperor Titus Flavius Domitianus, that's Emperor Domitian, uh, exiled to the island in 95 uh, AC, or we would say AD. During the, this, during the time of his exile, that lasted 18 months, and that's another early church tradition, that he only stayed on the island for 18 months, and then he went back to the mainland. Uh, whether that is true or not, we cannot verify. Um, but that is during this time that John put together the book of Revelation. Here is a monastery on the island of Patmos indicating uh, the place where John would have been held. There is also uh, a cave or the cave of the apocalypse uh, as it became known traditionally. Uh, the cave in which John was supposedly held is situated be between Korah and Scala and it is said that it is there where the apostle John wrote the apocalypse. Uh, surrounding the cave is a monastery now, where, that's the previous picture, where John used uh, to live during the period 95 to 97 uh, AD. More on the island of Patmos. Uh, it has been a part of Greece since 1947. That's just modern day uh, times. And it may be reached by boat from uh, different places. Uh, the ferry from Salmos takes about two and a half hours and so on. Um, and then the Romans used the island as a penal settlement to which they sent political agitators and others who threatened the peace of the empire. Uh, according to Eusebius, uh, John was banished to Patmos by the emperor Domitian in AD 95 and released 18 months later under Nerva. Um, and, and that is a quote again from uh, BibleWord.com. When it, when it comes to the contents of the book of Revelation, um, it, it can be very, very complex. And there are three major themes that we need to highlight in the book of Revelation. The first one I've already referred to, chapters 1 to 3, an introduction in chapter 1. In chapter 2 and 3, we have the seven letters written to the churches in Asia Minor. And then that's the first section, the introduction. The second major section is a description of the history until the return of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not just what is going to happen in the future. Again, as I said to you, interpreters use different ways and interpretations and approaches to the book of Revelation. Some people see everything in chapters 4 to 19 as referring to the future. It's still to come. However, I am personally of the opinion that John is describing salvation history in its totality. In other words, he's describing what God has done, is doing, and will be doing in the future. And so that's the way we need to look at that. We'll break it down in a, in a few moments' time. And then chapters 21, 20, 21, and 22 really 
focus specifically on the return of Jesus Christ. We have the new heavens, the new Jerusalem, and all of those things described uh, in those final chapters. And that is very specifically about the return of Jesus Christ. The middle section is the one where we have those difficult um, descriptions of uh, sevens. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And there are more sevens in the book of Revelation. And um, they, they're taken by many commentators as a sort of a parallel. So you need to look at seven seals running right through history. You need to look at seven trumpets running right through history. And then seven bowls running through history as well. One way of looking at the book of Revelation, it, personally I think it makes a lot more sense as far as I'm concerned. Um, but as I said, others would definitely disagree uh, with that. That the same events are actually described, but from different angles with different perspectives. When we look at a, a detailed outline and an overview uh, of the contents of Revelation, I, I believe it helps us to paint the picture of the story. I've already referred to the fact that there are many, many options. Um, and so uh, this is just one option. And what I'm going to do is just give you a quick breakdown of the different chapters and roughly what we find in them. I wish we had time to read it all, but I would only encourage you to maybe use this outline and then to go through the book of Revelation, even if you don't read every single detail, but to try and keep yourself um, informed in terms of the outline, but then reading the book of Revelation along with that. When it comes to chapters 1 to 5, we have introductions. Chapter 1 is the vision of Jesus Christ. John is on the island, he describes that, and he turns around, he sees someone speaking to him, and it turns out to be Jesus. And it's described in, in different forms. It's not the same picture we have in the Gospels. In the Gospels, we have Jesus living on earth. He's a human being, he dies on the cross, and he is pretty much just a human being, as we would see a normal human body. But the visions of Christ in Revelation are very different and very varied as well. Um, you now have a person who has been elevated, and, and the vision of Jesus Christ is very different. And then in chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches, and then in chapters 4 and 5, we have John now seeing the visions of God in heaven. The heavens are open. Uh, John is, is given an opportunity, the privilege of seeing history from God's perspective. And so God is on the throne, and God invites John into this picture to be able to see what is happening and how things have unfolded. And there are four living creatures. Um, there, there's a scroll that is unfolded. The scroll represents history, and only the Lamb of God is the one who can open the scroll. Uh, the Lamb of God, in this case, is Jesus Christ. And then there is a lot of worship in chapters 4 and 5, as we have already seen in chapter 4. In terms of the location of those seven churches, you will find them all uh, on the western side of modern-day Turkey, which was the province of Asia Minor. Uh, there are plenty of maps uh, that you can look at, um, and, and it will tell you all those red little dots there represent uh, the, the seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, there are more churches. For example, Colossae is not mentioned over here, but that's one of the churches that we looked at where Paul uh, perhaps may not have visited, but certainly there was a church planted and he wrote a letter uh, to that church. But here we have several other churches not mentioned elsewhere. Smyrna, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, not actually mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. But obviously, uh, according to the book of Acts, the gospel spread in that whole region and many churches were established. When it comes to seals and trumpets, uh, we then go to chapter 6. And this is where those the number seven becomes very important. Chapter six, the opening of six of the seven seals. You almost get a bit of a pattern here now, uh, as you will see in a moment. And then chapter seven, verses one to 17, there's an interlude uh, before the opening of the seventh seal. And there's the description of 144,000 people before the throne. There's a multitude of nations and people and languages uh, before the throne. And then in chapter 8, the seventh seal is opened, um, and then the blowing of six of the seven trumpets is also described in this particular section. And then there's an interlude in chapter 10, and that is followed by the seventh trumpet. And so you have this bit of a uh, pattern, six open, interlude, seventh one. 
uh, six trumpets, an interlude, and then the seventh trumpet. And then as you go on to the great battle, um, in chapter 12 uh, and 13 to verse 1, we have the cosmic conflict between good and evil, and it's described in symbolic language as a woman, obviously it's the good, the church, and the dragon, which is Satan. Uh, and everything that Satan represents. And there are many different pictures and animals and things described over here. In chapter 13 and 14, we have beasts, uh, more evil, uh, in, this, in a description of beasts coming out of the sea and out of the land, and then believers and the judgment day. There's a beast from the sea, there's a beast from the earth, there's a lamb, and there's, the, again, the 144,000 uh, people or, or saints. And then there are flying angels, and they're going, and now they're reaping, they're bringing in the harvest, uh, as it were. And then, uh, as we continue, we have uh, the final judgment described. And now we, we, we're heading towards the future. In chapter 15 and 16, we have seven angels, seven plagues, and seven bowls. In chapter 17 and 18, uh, we have the fall of Babylon. Uh, there's a woman on a beast, and there is the fall of Babylon. Babylon meaning evil, representing every evil. It may be Rome in the time of John. Uh, for us, it would represent whatever is evil. Babylon would represent any evil uh, in this world. And then the final reality is described by John, in, as I said, in chapters 19 and further. The return of Jesus Christ, there's praise, there's a wedding feast, there's a rider on the white horse, and again, it's Jesus. And uh, we've now had Jesus as the Lamb of God, a lamb slaughtered. Uh, we have him as a rider on a white horse, and many other different pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 20, uh, the millennium. Millennium referring to a thousand years of reign, there is Satan who is condemned and, and then thrown into hell and the great white throne and the judgment there. And in chapters 21 to 22, uh, we have a description of the new heaven and the new earth. There's a new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. Uh, in a certain sense, and this is the way that I personally interpret this, heaven and earth is now combined. Whereas for us now, uh, heaven is, is a different reality out there somewhere. But in the new reality, heaven and earth will be combined and we'll live on a new earth. And, and heaven will come down to earth, the new Jerusalem. There's no need for a temple because God is present in this new reality. And so there's no temple anymore. Um, there's the bride of the Lamb. Again, it's a reference to the church. And um, in chapter 22, right at the end, there's simply just a, re a reference, a, a plea for the second coming. Um, and there's the river of life and the words, I am coming soon. And John exclaims and, and, and he says, please come soon. Uh, Lord Jesus. So that gives us a, a, just a, a brief little feel of the contents of uh, Revelation. Now, before we try and interpret that or put that in some kind of perspective, um, let's take a, a quick break and then we'll come back and make, try and make some sense out of the book of Revelation. All right, as we look at how we interpret the book of Revelation, uh, in a certain sense, our brief little journey through uh, the content of Revelation may be dissatisfactory. I wish we had a lot more time. And, and, and to be honest with you, I wish I understood it a lot better so that I can with major confidence come here and say to you, this is exactly how you interpret the book of Revelation. I just don't have that confidence because I'm struggling over many of those issues myself. Um, but when you look at the book of Revelation, um, and you will see on this picture, it's just someone's, uh, I don't know whether there's someone who was playing around with it, but use a lot of pictures. And there's a, there's a dragon and there's a lion and there's a, uh, all sorts of animals and there's a sword and there's seven heads and, and seven horns. And, and uh, it, it's a lot of violence. You almost need an 18 restriction read on the book of Revelation when you look at the violence um, in this book. There are many, many interpretations of the message of the book of Revelation. And uh, we don't have time to look into all of them. Uh, but each of the views uses different scriptures as well. Not just looking at Revelation, but adding to it Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Matthew, and, and other parts of the Bible. And it, it, you have to do that. But at the same time, um, one stands danger of, of reading stuff into the book of Revelation that John may not have intended. So it's that, that fine balance of not... not reading your own view into the book of Revelation, but allowing the book of Revelation uh, to interpret itself. For some scholars and theologians, everything 
falls or stands on their interpretation. If you don't accept theirs, then you don't believe the Bible sort of thing. I don't hold that view personally. Uh, I, I, I'm very open to hear other interpretations on the book of Revelation. As I said to you, I don't have that sort of firm conviction to say this is the only way that you can read uh, the book of, of Revelation. Several things that I want to highlight from this book. The one is the difference between literal and figurative interpretation. There's no doubt that most of the Bible needs to be taken literally. However, there's also no doubt that some parts in the Bible cannot be taken literally. They, they are written as symbolic language. The book of Revelation uh, in its general style is definitely one of that, where you have to look at symbolism. Uh, symbols thrive in the book of, uh, and they abound in the book of Revelation. Um, most of the numbers, the number six, we've already seen, 666 is a multiplication of the number six. Seven is your complete number. And so wherever you find seven in the Bible, you, the, one of the first questions you need to ask yourself is, is, is this a symbolic reference or is this a literal number? And, and it's a difficult question sometimes. In the book of Revelation, I have personally very little doubt that the, the number seven, and as most of the numbers, are actually symbolic. And they represent something. Like the number seven represents fullness or completeness. And oftentimes God is seen as seven, or the number seven, because it's, it's complete. In seven days, God created everything. It's a complete uh, creation. And the number seven occurs again and again in the book of Revelation. The number six represents man. It's one less than seven. In other words, it's not complete. It's incomplete. And therefore, it represents man and sometimes sin as well. And again, you have to ask yourself that question. Is this symbolic or is it not? Ten, twelve, and then any multiplication of those. Twelve times two, we've already seen that, representing the church uh, or the people of God, both Old and New Testament. The number 144,000 is a complete number of those who belong to God. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe it's a literal number and they work very, very hard in order to get into that 144,000. Now, I, I believe they're wrong uh, because it's not meant to be a literal number. They can't only be a special core of Christians in the heaven who are part of the 144,000 and all the others are sort of second-rated Christians or whatever. I, I believe the Bible doesn't support that idea at all. So I, I believe 144,000 is symbolic. The names Babylon, the name dragon, or the concept of a dragon, a woman on a beast, uh, a woman sitting on a number of hills, uh, they are very obvious symbolic uh, references to whatever. Uh, and, and then whatever is the problem, because that, that's where we fall short. We, we don't live in the, in the uh, first century AD so that we can immediately recognize what the symbol stands for. So that is part of our challenge. But John was no doubt using the apocalyptic genre to communicate the truth about God's control of history. That is the main thing in the book of Revelation. When you lose that, you lose the whole picture. So every time I need to ask myself, what do I learn about God and God's control? I may not understand the detail, but ultimately the big picture, the big theme is God is in control. Some of the common symbols used in the book of Revelation, the seven churches, they were real churches. The remains in Ephesus and Sardis and uh, Philadelphia and those are there as proof of the fact we're talking about real cities and real churches. Uh, Paul planted the church in Ephesus. He wrote a letter to them. Uh, he left Timothy in Ephesus to pastor the church. So those are real churches. However, having said that, symbolically, the seven churches, seven being a complete number, also refers to churches uh, everywhere in the world and for all ages. In other words, this is the complete picture of the church of Jesus Christ. And so we can learn, and we still learn, even till today. We learn from what God, what Jesus wrote to those seven churches, and we can apply it to ourselves. The throne I've already referred to is a reference to God's reign. Um, the Bible clearly says that nobody can see God and God is spirit. So does it mean that God sits with a body on some kind of a throne somewhere in a particular place? Perhaps not. Perhaps this is a symbolic reference to the fact that God is ultimately in control. 
and that John saw a vision of reality. What is reality? Reality is God is big, He's great, He's awesome, He's in control, but God does not sit in one single little place on a throne. I, I, that's not my perception of God. So again, it's a symbolic reference. The lion and the lamb is always Jesus Christ. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the, the, the Jesus who, who was born in Bethlehem in a human body and grew up in Nazareth and died on the cross was a human but the Jesus in Revelation takes on a variety of different forms um, and, and sometimes very interesting ones. The four living creatures represent all of creation. The 24 elders uh, represent the church of Jesus or the church of God, or the people of God. The seven spirits I refer to in chapter 4, sometimes called the sevenfold spirit. It's just another way of translating that. It refers to the Holy Spirit. Again, it's the complete spirit. It's the, uh, it's the full spirit of God. Um, and Interestingly enough, it's in symbolic terms referred to as the seven spirit. It doesn't mean that there are seven spirits of God. There's only one Holy Spirit in the Bible. Uh, but in Revelation, it take, uh, the Spirit of God takes on symbolic form. And then the scroll, um, where the scroll is brought out, and no one is found worthy to open the scroll. What is the scroll? The scroll is insight into history. Who has this insight? Well, Jesus is the one who unfolds it. You go through the Old Testament, you live in this world, you don't understand what, what, what is happening. How do we and how can we understand? Because Jesus is the one who can break the seal uh, and the seven seals. He's the one who breaks those seals and he unveils, he, he, he reveals history uh, to us. And then I've already spoken about the 144,000, the white-robed crowd before the throne uh, are the people who have been saved. Uh, the multiple languages and nations and so on before the throne. The dragon is clearly Satan in chapter 12, verse 9. He is even, even indicated as uh, Satan. So that's the dragon. The woman clothed with the sun. That's the church in chapter 1, verse 12. And the number 666. The, it's the number of man in chapter 13, verse 18. And in John's time, may have referred to Nero. The Hebrew version of Nero, of Nero the name Nero, can be calculated to come to 666. Uh, the Hebrew alphabet uh, has numerical value, and ev every letter in the alphabet has been given a numerical value. And when you, when you write Nero in Hebrew, you, you come to 666. Many people in history have found plenty of others, whether it is Hitler or Mussolini or whoever it was, they, some clever way of designing that, and you can come to the, to the number 666 if you find a clever way of doing that. Uh, I, I personally think it's probably a waste of time because it refers to some evil person and in this particular case to the Antichrist ultimately. And Babylon, as I said, is the enemy of the church. When we look at Revelation and the second coming, which is a major theme in the book of Revelation, we're talking about God's control. The second coming, there's no doubt that Revelation tells us about history, past, present and future especially the future aspect that received the most of our attention through history. Uh, many people are simply just intrigued by a date and a time. And looking at the events in the world, I remember growing up in, in, my, in my, my dad who was a pastor, and, uh, and, and, and the European Union was established, and they reached the number 10 or something. I forget exactly what it was, but I, I remember how excited people got because this is now fulfillment of prophecy. They were just waiting for that last little horn that was going to grow. Whatever. I had zero idea what they were talking about. I still don't have an idea what they were talking about because we're now years on and the European Union is much bigger than the numbers that we find in the book of Revelation. So I'm cautious. Uh, I don't want to just write it off altogether but at the same time, I'm extremely cautious when it comes to world, current world events to say, I can make the link. There's a world event. Here's Revelation. The two must be linked. Therefore, Jesus is going to come back X, Y, Z. So I'm very, very cautious and actually critical of that. Um, it is in this regard that we have to just briefly look at that concept of the millennium because it refers to the second coming. And when it comes to... Um, the, the last module and uh, our last lecture in the last module. We're going to talk about the second coming and, and, and we'll talk about this in, in more detail. But especially this concept of a thousand year reign has had people 
looking in different directions as to exactly how things will pan out. How, what, what, are, what are going to be the events around the second coming of Jesus? And that's essentially what the, the millennium views uh, are about. It refers to a thousand years, and John referred to the thousand years in chapter 20, verses 1 to 8, referred to or mentioned six times in this particular passage. I want to highlight the fact that it's the only place in the Bible where a thousand years refers to Jesus' second coming. Nowhere else, nowhere else do you find the concept thousand years or millennium in reference to the coming of Jesus. So that's something I just need to emphasize. But the main interpretations of Revelation and the second coming of Christ can be summarized by looking at different views around the millennium. And uh, I'm just going to do it very briefly on one slide, and then uh, in the second, or in the last module rather, I will expand a lot more when it comes to a description of these uh, different views. Now, it's sort of take your pick, as it were. Um, the first one I want to refer to is the historic pre-millennialism. Pre-meaning, um, the second coming will happen before the millennium, millennium the thousand years. Jesus will return to this earth, and he will then have some kind of a, a, a reign of thousand years here on earth. At the end of the thousand years, the judgment will take place and eternity will then arrive. And people will be sent to heaven and hell and so on. A millennialism, where A is a negative, A is a denying or negative. In other words, there is no such a thing as a thousand year reign. People who believe this see a thousand years as, again as symbolic, as much of Revelation needs to be interpreted as symbolic. So they say a thousand years refer to a complete number of the reign of God. And they say there is no such a thing as a physical thousand years of reign of Jesus. Already we're living 2,000 years after Jesus came. And for all of these 2,000 years, Jesus is in control. God is in control. Jesus reigns. And so it's a symbolic reference to the reign of Jesus over this world, although you may not necessarily see it. That's the major criticism against this view. Is where, where do you see the peace that is talked about in the millennium or the time of the millennium? There is another version of the historic premillennialism. It's called dispensational premillennialism. Big words. And it's a whole series of events that will follow one after the other. In other words, we're living in different dispensations, and they will call it the dispensation of the Old Testament. Uh, then there's the dispensation of, of the Christians, the Gentile Christians. Then there's going to be the dispensation of the Jews. Uh, and and there, there's going to be a secret rapture where the Christians are going to be taken out of this world. Uh, then there will be a seven-year uh, tribulation period. Then Jesus is coming back. Then he rules for a thousand years on the earth. Then the judgment will take place, and so on. It's called dispensational premillennialism. Um, I'll say just this much, that I personally don't see any biblical reference to a secret rapture. I see Jesus coming again, and that he will come, and every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. That, that's, that's the biblical version of Jesus' second coming. So the secret rapture, where people will remain behind and, and continue to live on earth uh, for a while, uh, I have major problems with that particular view. And then there is a, not a very popular view, but post-millennialism. It simply says that the world will get better and better and better. And at the end of the millennium, which is a symbolic reference, the end of this reign of God, of Jesus, then the world will come to a better uh, situation, and then Jesus will come back. Uh, so the world will get better and better. There are not many takers for this particular view anymore, uh, because I think the world wars have shown us that the world is not getting any better. And right now, with all the riots and uprisings and so on around the world, uh, the world is certainly not getting uh, much better. So I don't think many people believe this anymore. There are other views um, around that and expansion of these views, but we'll, we'll give more attention to that in module number four. Now, when it comes to the message, I think... You know, one thing is, is reading through Revelation, but trying to summarize the message of the book of Revelation, uh, I think will bring it to a conclusion for us. We need to understand something about God, that He exists as the creator of the universe, 
that he steers the course of history. That is a very, very clear message in the book of Revelation. It gives me a huge amount of comfort. I know that God is on the throne. I may not feel it, I may not see it, experience it every single day of my life, but the knowledge that needs to to sink into my heart daily is that God is on the throne, regardless of what is happening around me. I've been challenged just recently reading the story of Abraham. He was almost 100 years old. He lived with a promise. Now, I am sure that Abraham constantly doubted that promise. In fact, we read about how he argued with God and said, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm actually old. It, it can't happen anymore. I can't have a child. But he, did, he never disbelieved God. He never left his belief, his faith in God. He always believed in God. He didn't necessarily believe in a son but he believed in God. And that, to me, is an important distinction. I believe in God. I need to continue to believe in God, regardless of what is happening to me. I may lose uh, a family member uh, through death. I may pick up cancer. Uh, I may have disasters in my life. I may even be persecuted for my faith. But the one thing I never should lose is my belief in God. God is on the throne, eternally existing, and He is the one who deserves praise. That is clear in the book of Revelation. God is worshipped. He will be worshipped uh, by all of creation. Ultimately, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And God exists as a triune God. Uh, that picture also is clear in, in the book of Revelation. God on the throne, the Lamb around the throne, and the seven spirits uh, or the sevenfold spirit uh, is, is there. So those three descriptions we find very clearly in the book of Revelation. And then there's the Son of God, Jesus Himself. Both God and Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb, are recipients of praise and worship. Names, titles, worship, descriptions of Jesus abound in the book of Revelation, from riding on a white horse to a lamb that looks like he's been slain. Again, it, it's, a, it's a symbolic reference. Uh, the Jesus that I know is a, is a Jesus, in my mind, sitting on a throne, ruling. I don't see pictures in my head of a lamb that you know, has been slain with blood flowing, anything like that. But that's the vision that John had. So it's different descriptions of Jesus throughout the book of Revelation, giving us different angles, different descriptions of the way we can look at Jesus and what he came uh, to do for us. He's the lion, the lamb. He's the king. He's worthy to be praised. He's the one who shed his blood, the one who paid the price for sinners, the one who has won and will win the battle. He is the rider on the white horse. There is the people of God. God is gathering unto himself a people, a people. It's not in the plural. There's one people of God that God is gathering. Uh, there is not an Old Testament God and then a New Testament God gathering two kinds of people. There's one single people that God uh, is gathering. And they are the new people of God. And they have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's the only kind of people that will live internet, internally with God. They are in, in a battle with Satan in this world. Uh, but they will be victorious because Jesus lives in them, and Jesus already won the battle, and he will continue uh, to win the battle through them. And though they are being persecuted, they, if they endure to the end, then they will be saved. In terms of the end times, um, eschatology uh, is a word we use for this. Uh, it, it's uh, taken from the word eschatos, which means end or end times, and obviously uh, ology is the study of the last things. Uh, believers have their eyes on the world, on this world, the battle, but as we battle, we also look up because we know that God uh, is in control and that Jesus already won the battle and that final victory is promised and secure. Future victory is based on the victory that already won by, by Jesus. And um, Revelation abounds with descriptions of the future uh, reality. There is eternal life. There is comfort. The tears will be wiped off their faces there is the coming of Jesus Christ. There is peace. There is a new heaven. There's a new earth. There is a new Jerusalem. Um, there is the, the fact that we'll see God face to face. So all of those things describe that new reality that we anticipate somewhere in the future. The revelation creates this expectation. Just bait fuss, as it were. Hang on. Uh, hang in there. Because Jesus is in control and Jesus is coming back to come and get you, uh, to come and fetch you. 
And therefore, John, John's exclamation is something that we can repeat, and that is, Amen, or Amen, come, uh, Lord Jesus. Some of the gems that we find in the book of Revelation, great worship sections. I, I can only encourage you to read them again and again and go through them and join in worship because right now there are saints in heaven, uh, creatures in heaven, um, elders in heaven bowing before the throne and, and we are invited into that worship experience. The seven letters to the churches make for great study and sermons and then the victory of the Lamb as described in chapter 20 and the second coming in chapters 22. Uh, it brings us to the end of our study of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Uh, I trust that you've enjoyed learning more about God's Word. Um, if you have been with me in the Old Testament and now the New Testament, I trust that the, the whole picture is becoming clearer in your mind. Uh, it's a long journey, but I, I trust that it's been an exciting one for you and that it will learn to, uh, that it will lead to a deeper knowledge of God Himself uh, in your own life. Um, you can look at the bibliography, uh, the fourth module, um, just to give you a little bit of a taste of that. We will be looking in, in those eight lectures at God, creation and revelation, mankind, sin and condemnation, salvation, the person and the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and then also the second coming of Jesus. We also look at the church and the role of the church in this world. So those are the study themes uh, as we look at now that we have done the detailed study of the books, we'll take a step back and say, how does this all fit together in themes uh, in the Bible? And so that's where we're heading in the fourth module. So I trust that you will enjoy reading the New Testament. And please read the New Testament. May the Lord bless you.